Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stanford University mathematician Gunnar Carlsen. Thank you very much. I'd like to talk to you about a project that started 10 years ago as a DARPA project and has now moved to a point where it's commercialized and it's available software. So I, uh, um, I'm going to talk mostly about the, uh, the, the science of it. So let me... Um, okay. um, there's a lot of talk, as we all know, about big data. It's become a lot of hype around it. It's a buzzword. Um, but I would argue that it's not all about the big, that we're actually handling the big pretty well in many cases, the storage uh, and the dealing with the size. Uh, but in fact, that sometimes it's more about making understanding of it, making about it, that in fact, that it's more about uh, complexity. Um, and, and what do we mean by complexity? Um, well, it means a few things. It comes in many forms, including the, both the structure of the data uh, and its format. Oftentimes when we talk about complex data, it could be uh, free text, for example, or it could be uh, large molecules. Um, but even very small data sets can exhibit structural complexity internally, not just from the form of it, but the structure of the data sets. I claim um, that it, this requires an organizing principle. We're going to need to somehow understand how to organize data which, whose structure is quite complex. Um, and so here's a paradigm for it that, that, that we have taken as something that, that, one should, that one should use and can use profitably. And it is that data has shape and the shape matters. In fact, uh, the shape is sometimes, the, it's always the first thing you'd like to know. It's sometimes the only thing that you need to know about the data, but that the shape itself provides a very useful organizing principle. And let me claim that everybody in this hall already knows this, in a sense. Uh, because everybody in this room has seen this picture in some form or other, a linear regression picture. So what, let's think about what's happening here. We have a bunch of data points, and typically it's much larger than the set I've drawn here, but uh, we have that large set of data points, and it is being well approximated by a shape, in fact, a very simple shape, the shape of a straight line. When that is available to us, when, in fact, we do have a straight line that's approximating the data, it allows us to do a lot of things. It allows us to predict off the data. It allows us to have an overall understanding of what variables vary with which other ones and in which direction uh, and so forth. So it is a very powerful thing when it exists, when the data actually does fit along a line. However, as we know, not all data fits along a line. Sometimes the following happens instead. The data actually, there's no line that fits across all these, uh, but it breaks up into three distinct, conceptually distinct clusters. And when that happens, that's also very useful information. And let me point out that there's a different shape that one can approximate to here, not a straight line, but the shape which is three distinct points, three, you know, three isolated points. So here we might think of those as the centroids of these clusters. And so uh, that turns out to be extremely useful in its own right, as, as I'm sure uh, many of you know. Let me point out that linear regression and regression methods are a big subject in statistics. Cluster analysis, uh, the kind that brings out these clusters, is another subject within statistics, a very large uh, heterogeneous kind of subject, quite different from uh, linear regression analysis. Um, now, if all data fit into clusters or lines, then we'd be done and we'd be happy we could fold up the tent and go home. But we might then get confronted with a data set that looks like this one. This kind of uh, shape of data occurs frequently when you have data that is undergoing recurrent or periodic behavior. Um, and so now let's look at this and we could say, well, are we going to develop yet a third piece of mathematics to try to capture these loops? We could do that. We could probably build a loop detector. Um, and we might do that, but on the other hand, it's not ideal. The way we would think about that might be through Fourier analysis. When the period, though, isn't uniform, that doesn't necessarily work so well. Nevertheless, we could do it. We would have built three separate methods, uh, mathematical methods for analyzing data. Um, but then we might get confronted with the following. And yet another kind of shape here, y-junction, this could occur, for example, when there's a process going on, the normal points, the normal behaviors are at the middle of this y-junction, and then the extreme behaviors are at the tips. 
So now we could say, although we're getting a little tired because we've developed three separate parts of mathematics at this point, we might say, let's build a Y-junction detector. OK, probably we could do it, but we have this sick feeling underneath that, that the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to get some new data set with some new different kind of shape that we want to capture. And so the idea is, let's get away from the one-off building things that capture individual shapes, but let's do a kind of modeling that actually captures all the shapes, can capture all the shapes in an appropriate sense at once. OK, so the question is how to model data. Usually, we model data with algebraic methods, uh, algebraic equations, uh, perhaps involving you know, polynomials and so on, but basically uh, regression methods or machine learning methods that use a lot of heavy uh, algebra. But capturing all kinds of shapes requires different methods because algebra is very powerful when it works, but it's also somewhat limited and rigid in that it can't capture, typically, uh, a lot of singular kind of behavior. And so, we kind of called this method topological data analysis. Initially, we were arriving at a point where we're going to say, actually, let's talk about network modeling of data. Let's take data which doesn't come in a network form, and let's build a network model for it, a network being a collection of edges and nodes, which one can then lay out in the plane or in space and inspect and use and work with. OK, so what is the shape of data? Normally, it's defined in terms of a distance metric, which is, or a dissimilarity measure. Uh, Euclidean distance, Hamming distance, correlation distances are certainly examples. Many, many others that you have to invent for more complex data. Um, <clears throat> it, encodes no sh it encodes similarity. Typically, that, that is to say, points that are nearby to each other are, um, uh, are close, are, are, are similar, and points which are far apart are dissimilar. But so what is topology then? Why did I call it topological data analysis? Well, topology is, is the mathematical formalism which concerns itself with measuring and representing shape. Um, it's been part of pure math since the 1700s, but what's happened in the last 10 years, last 10 to 15 years, is, is that it's been ported into what I would call the point cloud world, that is to say the world where you have finite samples from geometric objects, finite uh, data sets called point clouds. Um, and basically what it does, to, to give you an indication, the very first paper in topology did the following. It was a recreational math problem. Can you cross all the bridges across the uh, River Pregel in Königsberg, crossing each bridge exactly once? It was solved by Leonard Euler. And what he did, he solved it by recognizing the fact that a lot of the detail here doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how deep the river is or how wide it is or how big the islands are. All that matters is a certain network structure here, and you can see on the right, we've built this uh, simplified network which represents the problem. And by looking at that network, he was able to reason out and solve the problem. Topology has three key ideas. Go through these quickly. Uh, coordinate freeness invariance under deformation and compressed representation. So coordinate freeness just says it shouldn't matter so much how we represent the data set in terms of coordinates, provided that we uh, somehow are keeping track of the internal distances, the internal similarities. Um, secondarily, invariance to deformations, and this is what's really key to, to topology, it is saying that a very powerful property of the human visual system is the ability to recognize letters, um, even if they're in different fonts or if they're seen from an angle or if they're on the surface of a soccer ball. Uh, we can recognize that. We can recognize that the A is the thing with a loop and two legs, and the B is the thing with two loops. We do that very quickly without thinking about it, trying to get that same kind of robustness and understanding into understanding uh, point clouds and other kinds of geometric objects is what topology is all about. And just another example of this is a log-log plot of a circle, which is a little bit more data-centered there than, than, uh, than the fonts. And finally, compressed representations of geometry. So, if you look at the circle, it's infinitely many data points, if you like, if you take the complete circle, and infinitely many pairwise distances. Um, on the other hand, if we're willing to sacrifice a little bit of detail, and usually we are willing to sacrifice a little bit of detail, we can get the rough structure in a much simpler compressed form. So if you look there at the hexagon on the right, you can see uh, that it's represented by six nodes and six edges, which can be put inside a single byte. And so the way that one does this for geometric objects now is this. Take a, a simple 
mapping algorithm, which is what we're going to make for the um, point clouds, is this. We have a covering of a circle by three sets, red, blue, and yellow. They overlap. We're going to create for each connected piece of each and one of the subsets a node. So I've collected now, created four nodes, a red, a two blue, and a yellow. And now I'm going to say if any two of those co connected components uh, overlap, I'm going to connect them like this to create the edges. And lo and behold, I've created the circle back again in the form of a so-called nerve complex. Okay? Doesn't always work quite as beautifully as I said here, but nevertheless, it usually captures something about the geometric object. And so we're going to try to do this for point clouds. And the picture for this looks like this. So here's roughly speaking the point cloud sitting on top, the complicated point cloud. It is uh, covered by bins, red and yellow alternating, coming from a projection down onto that, onto that real line that you see there. And what I'll do is I'll perform a clustering step instead of a connected component step inside each one of those bins. So here's what comes out. This was our first sanity check on this, a simple, uh, small uh, diabetes data set from Stanford some 40 years ago. And I won't go into the details of it. The network is the same in all cases. It's been colored by different variables. Um, but this is a network describing these potential diabetes patients. There's one flare here which consists of the overt diabetics, one flare which consists of the um, pre-diabetics, and one which consists of the healthy patients. The point I would want to make, though, is so here is an example of one thing that you can do with network modeling. Namely, you can create a taxonomy uh, and generate hypotheses out of that by looking just at the network structure. Forget the colors. Imagine that you're colorblind for the moment uh, and just say, look, I see the three flares. I need to understand those three flares. When I understand those three flares, I'm able to go ahead and find the explanatory variables for those, in the one case, uh, blood sugar, in the other case, uh, insulin response. So this would be called unsupervised analysis. Here's something that came out of a collaborator of ours working at, at Stanford. He's interested in studying the progression of disease, going from healthy to sick and back again to healthy. And as you can imagine, the, those data sets coming out of various physiological variables will actually provide a, a loop shape. Because as you traverse, as you become sick, and now you start to return, you don't come through the same physiological path that you did as you were getting sick. You're, you're getting healthy along a different path. And what he finds very useful about this is the fact that you can actually um, get gene expression values for particular points in this process. So one can start to understand much better the function of what's going on in the, in the disease process. Another one here is hairpin folding data. So this is with our collaborators at Stanford, the Folding at Home group. Um, this is confirmations of a complex uh, molecule is the data set. What you can see is in the network, there's a structure of a line, but with a little bit of noise in the middle. What's true is that this process can certainly create artifacts. No question about that. And so if I were on a desert island, I would say, let's not look at this data set. Let's look at one with more stronger features to it. But we could go ask the scientists. And we said, look, how about in those, those teal or, or light blue regions, those the three nodes there in the middle, are they interesting to you? And in fact, they were. They were different trajectories to the folded state, which is what is being searched for in this kind of study. Um, and so the point here is that the method now allows you to capture detail, because this is a very small region of the data set inside a much larger data set. So detail within, within a larger data set, or weak signal, if you like. Uh, this is a, a similar uh, network constructed for uh, breast cancer. Uh, one of the benchmark data sets in breast cancer. Main point here is that in the lower right, you can see here there's one that's labeled ER sequence. Uh, that is a group in there in which it consists of about 8% of the patients, all of whom survived the length of the study. So this goes to another thing that one can do with this kind of modeling. It's called hotspot analysis. You can color the network by are there a sort of extreme concentrations within the network of various properties that you might be interested in, such as survival. Um, so this is uh, uh, one of the things that one can accomplish, and it cannot be accomplished by standard clustering methods. Because here is a, an example that shows you um, clustering, hierarchical clustering, done on the same data set. Um, and what you can see is there's a high-level decomposition into two groups. But the survival group, which is colored in red, is spread out all, all over one of those other groups. It's not concentrated. You can't get at it. You would not discover it in this method. Whereas when you retain the geometry of the flare, you do. 
Okay, uh, and just uh, one of the points about uh, breast cancer and, uh, in general, gene expression data sets is they often come from different technologies where the coordinates are not comparable in any sense of the word. So here's two different breast cancer data sets done in different technologies where there are no comparisons with the coordinates. And so the coordinate-free aspect of the topology allows you to see that both studies produce the same structure in there. You can see the survivors are that long structure with a, with a V split at the end, and then the non-survivors are a bunch of smaller clusters up above. And even those smaller clusters co correspond nicely to each other. Um, I've talked about, you know, you've seen examples of flares and loops, sort of gross features. One of the things that happens, though, is that when you have this representation, you find things that you might not have expected to find. So this is a data set coming from sequences from three populations, uh, Han Chinese, uh, Igbo tribesmen in Nigeria, uh, and uh, Caucasians in Utah. So the Han Chinese are the red group here, and any method that calls itself a method for data analysis can find these three groups. That's not an issue. It's, you can do that very readily. But if you look at it a little more closely, you'll see that there's some texture going on here. That is to say that the red, hand, the, the red group has a slightly different texture, more carpet-like, whereas the other two are kind of stellated. And uh, it turns out that doesn't have to do with the biology, but it has to do with the way that the study was done. That is to say, in the Chinese case, they removed parent and child pairs, which turns out to change that stellated local structure into more of a carpet-like structure. So that's the sort of thing you can discover here, which would be very hard to parse out uh, in, in, in other, using other methods. Um, <clears throat> more operationally here, if supposing that you are interested in trying to have, you have a model and you'd like to understand how it's working. In this case, we have a model from an intensive care unit data, uh, which is, uh, the, the data comes as questionnaires answered by the personnel in the, uh, in the ICU. And so they are collaborators of ours that built a predictor using genetic algorithms for survival. And you can see on the upper left, the network is colored by that actual predictor. But you can also color by ground truth. And so in the lower right here, we've colored by ground truth. You can see that the uh, predictor's doing something good. There's red going on on that far right. But there's also a red group in the upper left, which actually was green under the predictor. You can rapidly take that group, find the explanation for that. And the explanation in this case turns out that some of the questions were not filled out. These were questionnaires for which the questions about mood and energy and so forth were not filled out. So now you can modify your model in, in, in appropriate ways coming from that. And let's see, I'm running very short on time here. Let me, move, let me point out one other one here. Um, one can view this idea as a method also of trying to do search in a better way. Uh, that is to say, when we get a search result from Google, we'll get a long sequence uh, of results. Right? We get a long 10,000 uh, hits or 10,000 uh, different uh, answers to the query. If you look for Apple patents and use some natural language processing on it, you can instead get this kind of model for the result of the search. And this makes very clear which ones are sort of part of UI, which ones are part of various functions that Apple does. I'm going to pass on this one as well. OK. So let me just talk about very quickly then what um, we regard this method as, uh, as a solution to or as helping with. So the current analysis workflow is very clever people uh, think very hard and long about what are good hypotheses, and they come up with many of them. Those hypotheses are then uh, you know, studied uh, in, in various ways to see if they're validated or not, and ultimately uh, one gets then one's insights from those. However, this is very time consuming, and also it's not scalable. There are too many hypotheses with complex data. Uh, just too many things that one could try. And also many modeling mechanisms, I would argue, are too algebraic and too rigid to, to get at the full amount of information that you want. So what we do is we need a method that helps this generation process, you know, the thinkers, to help the thinkers act more efficiently. And that's what we regard network modeling as, or, or one aspect of it. We are modeling the data using networks instead of using algebra. It allows you to formulate hypotheses and perform analysis. I've talked about some of the things that one might do here, so-called hotspot analysis, where you're looking for heavy concentrations. But there are many ways of, for example, intelligently doing feature selection using these methods. 
And it is particularly useful if you believe that the answer to your question is actually complex and heterogeneous. If you believe that it is a solution to one optimization problem and there's a unique solution, then that's probably very workable. If you believe, on the other hand, that there's possibilities that there could be many different distinct phenomena going on, then this is the sort of thing you'd want to do because algebra doesn't capture it uh, adequately. Works on all kinds of data. All you need is a similarity measure. And it provides a feature-preserving feature compression of your data set. And ultimately, I would argue it is search somehow, uh, some kind of search or, or, or hunting through the data together with analysis in the same package. OK, so I'm out of time here. So uh, I think uh, we're now ready to go and do some, answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gunnar. Thank you. Thanks for a great launch into our technical Good. session. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rick Weiss. I'm Director of Communications at DARPA, and I will moderate the question and answer sessions after our plenary uh, speakers today. I think uh, Gunnar has done a great job of getting us to escape velocity out of the comfort zone of stuff that we already kind of know and understand and into the zone where we want to spend the next two and a half days exploring the uh, outer edges of those areas. So if you have questions to ask, um, there are the two microphones here that we'll be using throughout the next two and a half days. I want to make sure that you all understand also that, especially for those of you sitting in first class where we don't have microphones, uh, you can still ask questions either by going to Twitter and using the hashtag of WaitWhat15 uh, or getting into the activity feed of the WaitWhat app, which I hope, I know that actually most of you have downloaded, but there's a couple of hundred who still haven't downloaded it, so please download the app and use the activity feed to ask questions that way as well. Uh, I have a couple of questions that have already come in, but why don't we start right here with mic number two. Hello, my name is Dr. Amy Magnus. I'm from the Air Force Institute of Technology in their engineering physics department. Mm -hmm. I thought this was a beautiful presentation because pattern recognition is my field. One frustration that I have with my field comes when we compare, um, when we compare solutions to what we believe that we know. Um, there's a lot of work in error, which is model versus truth, but one of the things that you showed no, shows that there's a lot of model versus model. So the collection that you did with the data and model versus model is confusion. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's, there seems to be a lot of work in clearing up what we do with confusion and what we do with error. Do you have anything to say on that subject? I do. So, um, so, so first of all, you talked about model versus model. Um, so in fact, I have kind of swept this under the rug, but there are actually lots of tunable parameters within this, within this mechanism. You can choose, for example, what projection to use to, to bin, the, thing, uh, the, bin the, uh, the data and so on. What's nice, though, about the network representation is that you can put both models up uh, side by side. And imagine that you now think that you have a group, say, of high survivors in one of them, a very concentrated group. But you know, maybe you believe that uh, you know, it, it's, you, you're not sure of it, you're not sure that it's correct. You can then look at that same group in the other network representation. And if you see that it's concentrated there as well, that's a lot of information uh, about, uh, you, you know, about the fact that that group is really likely real. So there are a number of strategies like that. They go under the heading of a big fancy word, functoriality, which discusses maps between networks. And that is uh, sort of what I would regard as a novel method of doing the validation. There's also, of course, standard statistical methodology underlying this, which you can say, you know, the high glucose group. Is this really the high glucose group and so forth? Yeah. I think confronter. What is that? What that word? That would make a nice hashtag. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I, I'm not sure, but I think it might actually exist already. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see what conversations come up under that. Yeah, Thank very, you very much. Right. Uh, Gunnar, let me give you a question that's come in backstage okay. in the meanwhile. Uh, how does topological data analysis compare or interact with standard machine learning? Yeah, so there's a very strong interaction here. So machine learning is a methodology that's been developed over the last. I don't know, 20, 25 years, um, using a lot of kind of regression and, and, and very interesting uh, algebraic methods. First thing to recognize is that part of what we do with building these networks is we'll use the projection. And so we might very well use some of the projections, say a PCA or a multidimensional scaling coming out of um, a machine learning situation to build this network. And what, that's why I would, what I would argue is this is 
a nice uh, addition, this methodology is a nice addition to standard machine learning methods in that, first of all, it uses them, but second of all, it can make them more transparent. One of the things that happens to some of these methods, many of them, in fact, is that although they are kind of powerful, they also are a bit of a black box. And so what this will allow you to do is to start to reason about it, build some representations of the geometry of what's actually going on. So a small example of that was the one I showed here on the, uh, uh, on the intensive care unit. That was a machine learning example that had been done to build that uh, predictor. Um, and you can now look at it and find small but systematic areas of failure where you can modify the method, although perhaps having to go outside of the framework that you originally used, because that method may not be uh, flexible enough to capture such local phenomena. Okay. And I've got uh, one other question that came in remotely that we'll, we'll go to right here. What are the tasks mm -hmm. that uh, topological data analysis is most suited for? Right. So I would uh, go back again to what I said in the talk. In fact, whenever, if you believe that your data problem is amenable, you know, has a simple answer, has a simple one-point answer, say, or a simple line as an answer, then you may not need what we're doing here. If you believe, on the other hand, that the, the outcome, such as if, when you're studying fraud, for example, which is something I've had to learn something about, the answers are never simple. You know, it's not like there's one method of doing fraud. The answer is there's 10 methods of doing fraud, and they're all characterized by completely different things. And so if you go to do anything simple about saying, let me find the fraud by algebraic methods, it's going to be a mishmash. If you can, on the other hand, localize and say, look, I've got these you know, five or 10 different things that happen, and each of them can be characterized nicely, but in a completely different way from the other one, then those are situations where it's particularly, uh, this method is particularly powerful. Fantastic. If there's no other questions, we'll move on to the program. All right. Thank you. Thank you.